happy teardrop will down her cheek. She wanted to warm herself in that hope if she could. The audience, Yulmi and Catherine's father, sat beside each other. Your daughter is amazing. No, wait, no. His accent has just completely slipped. Now it's just me. Okay, God. She is, isn't she? I mean, pardon my arrogance, my liege. I'm a very proud father, you see. No pardon necessary, sire. Has she found a sponsor yet? The Duke of Versailles once spoke to me about it, but uh, we have not made any arrangements. He sounds the exact same as his daughter. Then I must steal her away as soon as possible. Sire! I like to be Catherine's primary sponsor. That is why. Why, sire? And to further see me in my status. That piano she is playing right now. Jesus! I bought it! Fire! Francois's eyes widened in astonishment. Look at his perfectly rectangular mouth. That's how you know when somebody is really surprised. D d d that is... Francois Gold. That is beyond generous, sire! Jimmy smiled. Well, I must make it hard for you to refuse me, you see. I like to make people offers they uh, can't uh, refuse, eh? Yeah. I took the opportunity of asking you out right. You see, the Duke might offer an extravagant piano plated in gold. In that case, I have no choice but to humbly concede. Uh, what? I am kidding. The Duke of Versailles is the worst miser you will ever need. The men chuckled. Ha <laughs> yeah, ha that, ha! That's a very funny uh, joke there, my liege. Please don't be at me. Of course. I shall be paying for a musical tutoring as required. Along with an ample stipend to accommodate your family. But... Ah, you don't have to look so surprised. Monsieur Paris. Your daughter is a star. There is an effervescence about her that enraptures the soul. Well, it's a good thing the writers know how to use a... The thesaurus. There is no doubt in my mind that she will succeed. Well, thank you deeply, my liege. Please, call me by my name, monsieur. This is in charge of one of my daughter's progress. I'd like to be a slave of your music. I want her to be constantly playing music. If she stops playing, I whip her. Of course, sir. That is a small price to pay for all your offers. On the contrary, monsieur. You don't have to decide now. Can I think about it? But if you don't, I will have to ask you to leave, you know, the, the country. Because I will hunt you down if you don't. And then capture her. Thank you, my lord. Oh, sorry. Uh, sire, you me. After the performance, I went to the garden. And they were just sitting talking. The fuck is this? person. Emile Parid wandered about the crowd searching for a familiar face. This piano girl's sister? Mother? Question mark? I don't know. She had arrived halfway through Catherine's performance just in time to gush her little sister's applause. Fortunately, she couldn't find her father in the crowd. When she finally caught sight of the back of his head. She approached him hastily. Father, there you are. I've been looking all over for you. Emile stopped as she saw the men man her father was talking to. It was none other than the Maquis himself. She fixed her hair self-consciously and curtsied. My lord, pardon my intrusion. I didn't realize. Gimme smiled at her kindly. You are free to intrude any time, my lady. Gimme smiled back, just as the rumor said. The Marquis was easy on the eyes. Hey. To whom do I have the pleasure, Quince? Can I press this? No, I can't press this. This is my eldest daughter, Emilie. Pardon me for not introducing her sooner. Chand. Gimme. Offered her a seat. 
Ibi sit down across the man. We it seems good talent them good looks running the family. Okay, I get that you're complimenting her, but who else are you complimenting? Him? The little girl? Yeah, some interesting tastes there, Marquis. Francois rubbed his neck. Yes, uh, my daughters are my pride and joy. Thankfully, they both took after her mother. She not, Monsieur Fried. The eyes are yours. Earnest, loving eyes. I'm getting so into this character now. And Veal snorted at such snappy words. Okay, great, you're my new favorite character. You seem to slightly acknowledge the ridiculous of this entire fucking business. So, you are now, by far, the most relatable character in the entire thing. Her father was clearly basking in the compliments. This really was the famous Gumi the rumors talked about, and he wasn't exactly much of a charmer, was he? She didn't know what all the fuss was about. The ladies in the house she worked for could not seem to stop talking about this man. Admittedly, there was something morbidly curious about the way he looked at people. Like he was always distracted and could only say words that were expected of him. I'm pleased to have finally met you, sire. I've heard a lot about you on my travels. Oh, good things, I hope. <laughs> Depends on the tabloid and the day of the week. Emily thought to herself and chuckled. <laughs> With the Dimitri household, sire. Ah, yes. I heard you marrying to the Venison. Oh, father, I told you not to tell anybody yet. Ah, I didn't. But you know how people talk. Uh, world, world travels fast. Pardon the comments, my lady. Please. You man. The conversation endured through the afternoon. Small talk, musical composers, our little town, Catherine's musical background, that's why I don't care. Yeah. Offering droll opinions on their particularly droll topics. All through the exchange, Emily and preserve the infamous Marquis de Gaulle. This was him? The audacious, shameless flirt of the royal court and tabloids? According to rumors, he was able to bed both the widowed Countess of Devonshire and her daughter. Now, if it was at the same time, that would be truly impressive. Oh, whoa! <laughs> okay, sold. I I'm with this game. Screw it. That one moment. Fuck it. And even had a tumultuous relationship with the Prince of Garnet. Oh, he's bi. Okay. A scandalous. He didn't limit himself to royalty, or so the tabloid said. His latest fling was with an English poet they say, almost killed him when he was caught with another man or woman. Ah, at this point, who knew what was real and what was a blatant lie made up by the newspapers? She had looked forward to meeting him. And here he was, finally, talking about sampling a new bakery's cream brulee. She couldn't say she was disappointed exactly, but the Marquis was a depressingly normal man. Maybe even boring, I believe, ventured. But he's secretly a vampire! Ooh. Oh my god! If this goes, like, straight into vampire territory, I'm going to stop playing. Okay, I'm going to keep playing, but I'm probably going to stop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see where it goes at the, after that point, but odds are I'm just gonna stop playing. Can we talk about this shitty-looking grass and these shitty-looking trees? Like, this is MS Paint type shit here. How infuriating. She wondered if she would suddenly say something coy or insist to dance with her. Just something outrageous. Honestly, so she could shoot him down. The man whom everyone was interested in. That would be a small victory for reasonable women everywhere. 
But because I think this is trying to be a romance story, she'll think that she's so that he's so ridiculous, and that reasonable, intelligent woman wouldn't fall for his like bullshit, and then she'll fall for his bullshit, and it'll be kind of like really, kind of fucked up your message there. But the Marquis was nothing but polite. He did not ogle. He did not touch unnecessarily, unlike certain priests I used to know. No audacious gestures or suggestive winks of the eye. They're not even look. Maybe it's not pretty enough. She didn't be thinking of that, but... Okay. How did we go from... A uh, weird homeless girl... Savagely sexually assaulted... Who has a weird, like, imaginary voice in her head that's her mother telling her that she's shit. And then she cut out her eye. How did we go from that to this fucking half-rate, half-assed, I guess, romance? Question mark, question mark, question mark? I don't know. I guess I'm just sort of waiting for the point in the story where it gets interesting again. <laughs> and the words spoken were without me... Uh, okay, some interesting symbolic imagery there. To Amelie, he started to look lonely underneath the facade of Caprice. Caprice. He seemed tired of all the gallivanting, the rumors, and the numerous flings. We are all a little lonely, aren't we? Perhaps even he... He invited the family over his chateau and commented on how empty, empty the building felt sometimes. Music was a guilty pleasure. It got him through the cold night. He said with a sad grin, I wouldn't mind a warm soul to touch. What? Fuck off. And before she could stop herself... Oh, God. Really? You're fucking falling for this? Emily had begun to imagine her, his lips on her neck. Or maybe he's a vampire. Is this foreshadowing? Is he gonna be a vampire man? Is he gonna get into fucking Twilight ass territory? On one of those cold. <laughs> Whoa, knights! Fuck it, what did I just miss? There, were, there was a flash here. Okay, I don't know. I, I turned the mature filter off, so I don't know what to expect. I don't know what sort of weird sexual f fuckery is waiting for me. Emily shook her head, drawing to raise her in her mind. They were having a perfectly mundane conversation. You know where this is coming from. They know it's music and all this. Yep. Oh, his wife's sick. Oh, that's sad. Sometimes the nights were cold. Francois, the Marquis, was speaking to his soul. He was a kindred spirit. Are they gonna fuck? At this point, I'm just, like... Literally every character seems to be in a position to have sexual intercourse with Marquis. Rose Girl, there's, like, Rose Girl's supposed to be the protagonist, I'm guessing. So, and she obviously has a thing for him. Uh, she, uh, Emile obviously has a thing for him. And, like, even the... These two, even the dad, they're having a weird relationship. And he's also been sort of creepy towards a little girl. Just a little bit. He wasn't a pompous showboat. Marquis even had a wine collection. Wow, that means he certainly isn't a pompous showboat. Such a down-to-earth, generous young man. You know, he's just an average, regular Joe. Go grab a couple of beers with him. Emily, your face is flushed. Are you alright? I'm I'm f I'm fine. Just the sun, probably. This was not true, of course. The afternoon sun had already lost most of its heat. Thankfully, Catherine provided a distraction. She ran towards her little huddle. Da -da -da. Oh, Rose Girl's back in it. The music stops. <laughs> oh shit! A young ragged girl followed behind her. Emily wasn't sure how old the girl was. Her dirty blonde hair hid the left side of her face. You could just see faint traces of scars peeking through. A surge of motherly affection caught hold of her heart. Hello there, young lady. The girl looked down at her toes, but she gave her a tiny smile. 
I see you've made a crown of flowers. You look very pretty. Thank you, madame. Catherine gave it to me. Hey, sister. This is Rosa. She's really nice. She knows the name of all the flowers in Sir Gilly's garden. Catherine, there you go again of your silly names. Hey, sister. Help me convince Papa to let Rosa stay with us. Catherine. Papa, please. Please let her stay with us. She doesn't have anywhere to go. Now, Catherine, that's not very nice. Rosa here is a girl. Girls can find work on the street, like, uh, you know, prostitution, or, I don't know, some form of slavery. She can find her way without us having to condescend to her and, you know, force her to take our help. She's like kidding you can just pluck from the street and take home like you always do with stray animals. Goodness knows we have all the stray cats of France living in our home. Yes, I know she's not a kitten. I know she's a girl. I figured out that much, Dad. But shouldn't we take her home even more so? Francois, sigh. Yee Chuckled under his breath. He was clearly enjoying this exchange. Why? I don't fucking know. Well, Sir Gilly, what do you think? Huh? How dare you talk to me? Gimme's face lost his casual bystander look. You're a marquee. I'm sure my father would follow your orders, right? Come on, give me a solid, eh? Shouldn't we take Rosa home? Yibby. Brows furrowed at being put on the spot so suddenly. This is where he gets like suddenly mean. When we get like really fucking bitchy all of a sudden. He still gl glanced at Francois, who was silently pleading him with his eyes not to humor the child. He cleared his throat. Well, I'm sure it's the to your father since you in the house. You will have to clothe and feed those, you see. Yes, but I've got that all figured out. Ever since sister moved to work, nobody minds the house anymore. And I have to wash the dishes every time. Ugh. Papa's so busy. And we always have enough food for the two of us. So Emil doesn't live with them? If Rosa stays, then I wouldn't be so lonely on my own. She'll wear sister's old clothes and we'll mind the house when both sister and father are away. Luke, I, I, I don't care. Just, just get the fuck away from me. She can wash the dishes sometimes, and I'll wash them sometimes. Besides, if it were up to me, I'd have people take one girl home in their house and give her food. Girls don't even eat that much. Not sure about boys. Hey. But I'm sure it's not too much that people can't take them home, too. One time, I ate one whole plate of potatoes, and my stomach hurt. Uh, we, were all, we were all there, Catherine. We all know that feeling. If Rosa was there, I wouldn't have eaten so much. Maybe. Meh. ba da ba da ba ba Gibby couldn't help but laugh. Hee hee. You peasants amuse me. Francois rubbed his neck in his embarrassment. I'm so sorry, Cyrus. He's very headstrong. Father, I'm sure taking Rosa in wouldn't be too much trouble for us. Financially, yes. My new work pays better. I'm sure we can adjust. Well, about that. Perhaps if Rosa was some asshole, it wouldn't be too much of a burden to your family. So you believe? What? Sir Gilly is great. You truly are a kind soul, sire. Not at all. I was needing another slave girl, and this one's blonde hair and lack of an eye will do quite nicely. I have a weird thing for that. I'm sure I need her help even more than she needs mine. Isn't that right, Rosa? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, I, I would love to offer my home to Rosa. Although I am still worried that it's supposed to be more complicated, sire. 
What about her family or her friends? Oh, I don't have any of those. <laughs> Except for the ones in my head. <laughs> Please take me home. Are we uh, violating any laws, perhaps? I'm not even sure. As long as it is consensual, Shia, the details can be smoothed out later. That's my motto. <laughs> the girl was quiet the whole time. She's looking at her toes or a Catherine. Rosa, do you have any family, relative, or friend to stay with? No, sire. My mother died a long time ago. But she guides me always. So please don't be compelled to mind me. No, don't go back to the streets, Rosa. You seem so fun and wacky and likable. It's September. It's going to be really cold soon. Sir Gilly will even give you work. Stay with us. But Catherine... Francois sighed and surrender. All right, all right. She can stay for the night. Yay. Bye-bye. Just for tonight, then we'll see if she wants to stay for longer. Catherine, you can't... Just hold people in the place just because you want them there. Do you understand? If Rosa wants to leave, she may leave. You cannot keep her like an object. Yimi cleared his throat. That is sound advice. Yes, Papa, I understand. God, we went over this the last time I brought home a person as a slave thing. Rosa, please make yourself comfortable in our home. Thank you. Papa's the best. Aces. <laughs> Catherine turned to me again. Sir Gilly, don't you think if everyone of a house takes one person home, nobody would freeze in winter? You should make it into a law. They'll obey you because you're a marquee. And because you're tall. Oh. So, people obey my orders. Because I'm tall. <laughs> With the compliment. <laughs> you amuse me greatly. Well, you're taller than my papa, at least. He'll never be a marquee. <laughs> yeah. Francois, hold on, sorry. Here's his embarrassment. Yeah, they're mighty marries. I don't care. Emily watched him curiously. That same sadness once again surfaced for the briefest moment. You live family, child. I'm quite yes. You made me want to settle on myself someday. He chuckled. Uh, uh, maybe. Emily's heart skipped a beat, really. Did he just look at her when he said that? She couldn't be sure. Good God, I hope not. Kathleen. Is perfect, though she is. It is one of the reasons why I'm very invested in her. Okay. Gimme knelt down so that he was eye to eye with Catherine. He patted her head like a dog. It's a lot of weird treating people as objects in this game so far. You're a very intelligent and kind hearted girl, Catherine. When you reach the age of 18, I will murder you. You are a star. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You're a star, goddammit. Monitually. Someday, I know. You will change. The. World. The world. At least I'd like to see you try. Hey. Whoa. Uh, did I skip one? So it goes from... At least I'd like to see you try, though. Mother? Whoa. Help me. My chest. I, I can't breathe. No. Ka... Catherine! Oh, ooh. Oh, this is a predicament and a half right here. 
Chapter 2, La Picure. It's funny, is it not? They always leave you. Such is the way of the world. The more you love, the more you lose. Oh, it seems like they'll stay forever, but they never do. I'm the only one who stays, my lovely Rose. My love is the only love you need. You were always so weak. Always so loving to people who did not deserve it. I told you to get rid of her, didn't I? I told you to be wary. I knew it from the start, my Rose. She was nothing but selfish. She led you astray. I listened to the crying in the background. Jump scare? Oh, shit. So I can't go back. To be honest, I just I don't like Catherine. She feels like so pre-prepared and such a sort of stereotype almost. It's like, hey, she's a spunky young girl and she's really wacky and she's really likable. So you know what? Fuck it. Let's pit let's pit Rose Girl against Catherine. This will be really fun. You fought so hard. You never used to fight with me. But now, she killed herself. Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh shit! Okay. So, uh, I didn't expect the uh, wacky, lovable little girl to commit suicide at some point in the story. But yeah, okay. Sure. As long as more weird, horrific violence happens, I'm gonna keep playing. Your sacrifice lost her in her selfish ways. I knew she would cause you pain. <laughs> Should we just really lay into this chick? Fuck it. It saved me the trouble of delivering you from her clutches. She was poison. I am glad she is gone. Your silence bothers me, child. She was important to me, mother. Oh shit, we're still recording. Uh, she was very important. I... I loved her. Mother only laughed as Rosa screamed out her pain. Rosa felt strong arms shake her awake. Rosa! She opened her eyes and was hit by a strange sadness that crushed her. She was dazed for a moment. Why was she so sad? And then she remembered. Her best friend was gone. She was gone. Gyoza? How are you feeling? Gimme, you sat by her bed. A hand in hers. Rosa didn't realize she had been holding on to it tightly in her fitful sleep. She broke from his grasp and clutched her knees. Ugh. She remained silent. I came to check on you. You went in the shock and lost the consciousnesses. I can only imagine how it must have been for you to see you. Like that. So shit! So she really did fucking just... Yuck. <laughs> Why do I find this so funny? I'm an awful fucking person. But it's just... Like, it, it, she just went from... Just normal fucking precocious girl stereotype where it's, oh, she's like the sort of comic relief to just, boom, commit suicide. I'm assuming there's some sort of reason why she killed herself. It wasn't just, you know, some whim. Like that. His words echoed in her brain, and she did not register much of their meaning. Rosa still refused to speak, and Gumi fidgeted with his glove. Do it with Dick soon as soon as possible, Rosa. I just wanted to let you know that she has been taken care of. You should be uh, sleeping with the fishes, you understand? Nobody will find the corpse. Nobody will find the corpse. He's... Oh, so this is Mother. He's hiding something. There was a slight triumph in Mother's voice. 
He wants to get rid of her body as soon as possible. Don't you see it, child? Tell me you're not falling for this. Rosa was tired. Mother, always a cynic, would say such things. She hated anyone who came close to Rosa's heart. Rosa didn't want to hear it. She didn't want to deal with anything right now. All she wanted to do was wallow in her loneliness, to curl up inside the hole Catherine had left behind and sleep. My child, tell me you see it. Well, I don't remember that, so I'm not going to choose that. Look at how unperturbed he is by Catherine's death. There is an absence of feeling in him, don't you see? It goes beyond the usual apathy of loneliness. Did he even really love Catherine? How well do you know him, child? I've known him for as long as I knew Catherine, mother. So how, how much time has passed? Are we talking like a month? We talking like a fucking year? We talking a decade? He is a close friend. I didn't ask how long you've known him, but how well. Beyond the mask he displays in public view. Do you even know his past? Do you even know any of his ambitions or secrets? He, he was always a private man, mother. Think back, child! Isn't it curious how all his past relationships have ended in disaster? Everything he touches crumbles. Uh, that, that, that is not enough to accuse him of anything. You idiot. He is different. He does not belong. You have felt it too, haven't you? Rose looked at Yumi with new eyes now. A hint of doubt slithered out from behind her sadness. Rosa wanted something to blame task for all her regrets. Gimme seemed like the perfect candidate, didn't he? Yes, you're finally seeing it. Open your eyes, child. It made sense. Gimme and Catherine's relationship began to pewter out into coldness right before she died. Her mental instability only served to compound the fracture in their relationship. Perhaps Gimme was tired of her and had her killed off for convenience. <laughs> Or perhaps Catherine, in her psychotic state, killed herself to spite him. Rosa stared at the man beside her. He is not to be trusted, child. He is a demon. Demon, 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 demon. Gimme returned Rosa's angry stare with a resolute look. I know you must did me, Rosa. I'm aware that I only have a very condition with my presence. I know the feeling. What I am unwanted. He stood up, a hard yet kind look on his face. Just remember that I will always be here for you. I must do whatever Catherine. The only she spun me out. Rosa bit her lip. When Catherine had refused to eat, it had been Yumi who had fed her and attended to her. Despite Catherine hurling abuse at him, he had tried to care for the sick woman herself. Lies! Oh, lies! Keeping up appearances. What is it that he's done, Mother? Catherine committed suicide. It's not by his hand that she died. Are you just going to leave it at that? Look at his face and tell me you trust him wholeheartedly. Look at that fucking snaky-ass liar face. Rosa tried to search for the answer in Gumi's eyes. But as always, his face betrayed only few emotions. I don't know. Mother was screaming now. He killed her! I am sure he did! And you're letting him get away with it! Please, my head hurts. And you say that you loved her. You never loved her, you selfish child. I've always known you were this selfish. You're a monster, just like your father. Stop. What did that bad man put in you? Did those wrong kids cross a line? I'm afraid I'll never understand, baby. I'm so sorry you had such a bad time.